I think we're in store for a really interesting um, session here. It brings together uh, a number of research themes from different groups on a, on a topic uh, which is, is very topical. Um, so we, we all know, and should be broadly familiar, with the toolkit of, of economic evaluation, uh, which broadly requires three things. Uh, one, the comparison of alternative interventions on the basis of their health effects, um, ideally using generic measures such as qualities or dallies. Uh, secondly, the comparison of alternative interventions on the basis of costs. And thirdly, some criteria to put estimation of costs and estimation of effects together to make informed uh, inputs into, um, into, into, in, in, into policy. So we need some criteria um, to assess um, value. Within the field of, of uh, health research broadly, uh, there's lots of research which is to, undertaken on, on the first of those requirements, estimating health effects. Uh, not always using uh, measures such as DALIs or QUALIs, which can facilitate comparison uh, across alternatives. There's um, more of a patchy uh, field of research on estimating the costs of interventions, and that's particularly challenging in, 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 in some cases, particularly in low-income settings. But until recently, there's been very little research at all, uh, either conceptual, conceptually and on normative basis or... or um, in terms of estimating uh, numbers, values, on the third criteria uh, of how can we put costs and effects together uh, to say something of, of value. Uh, cost effectiveness thresholds are the tool which are most frequently used in many cost effectiveness analyses to try to uh, meet that third criteria of in, informing uh, issues of, of value and uh, uh, inputting into, into policy decisions. But what cost effectiveness thresholds mean uh, differs for different people. One approach is to base cost effectiveness thresholds on measures of opportunity costs, so a supply side notion, if you like, of uh, based upon the ability of healthcare systems to fund uh, all alternatives. And our first speaker is Professor Carl Claxton, a Professor of Economics at the Centre for Health Economics uh, and the Department of Economics at the University of York who will speak to us about uh, cost-effectiveness thresholds based upon opportunity costs, so a supply-side notion of cost-effectiveness thresholds. Um, after Professor Claxton, we will have uh, a talk by um, Lisa Robinson, uh, who is the uh, senior research scientist at the Centre for Health uh, Decision Science um, at um, TH Chan School of Public Health at Harvard. Uh, who will try to uh, speak to us to explain and outline a second approach which addresses the question of what can we learn from the values that people place on, on health improvement. So this is really um, tailored around the demand um, for, for, for health and health improvement. Uh, finally, thirdly, we will have a talk by um, Ijoma uh, Doke from uh, Priceless at uh, Vich University in South Africa uh, on uh, innovative, an innovative study uh, which explores within that country, South Africa, uh, what uh, is achieved at the margin for healthcare spending. So looking at marginal productivity of healthcare spending. Um, professor Dean Jameson, uh, Professor Emeritus at um, the University of Washington and um, University of, of California will then lead us into a discussion so we'll be discussant uh, for the talks, and we hope to have a good 30 minutes for, for Q&A. Um, so if we can start off, please, with Professor Claxton. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking my uh, co-authors, Jessica Oshlek and uh, James Lomas, and also the support we've received from the Bill and Melinda uh, Gates Foundation. Um, let's be clear, if we are considering any kind of investment in healthcare, whether that's a particular technology, a specific technology, or a whole program of care, we need to have some hopefully evidence-based assessment of three things. What do we believe are the additional health effects 
uh, of that intervention compared to what we currently have available? What are the additional healthcare costs, additional resources required to deliver it? And most importantly, thirdly, what else could we have done with those resources? What else could have been achieved elsewhere in the healthcare uh, system if those resources had been released for other purposes? Let me try and kind of illustrate that. Imagine this, uh, this now blue, was green, but now blue on this screen dot, represents what we currently have available, which might be very little at all. We need to have some assessment of uh, whether this new intervention is going to improve health and to what extent for the population that we serve and what those additional costs are. We need a measure of health. Uh, uh, if we are interested in health, we need to be able to measure it and we need a comparable measure if we're going to make social choices that are fair because we're making different choices across different diseases for different people. We also need a comparable measure because we need to compare the benefits for this particular intervention with what we could have done elsewhere across many different types of diseases. So let's imagine we've done that. We've got a measure of health. It's going to combine survival and quality of life. We've got a few uh, options. We can have dallies, we can have qualies. I'm not so bothered. Uh, the only thing you need to know is dallies are bad, you don't want them, and qualies are good, more of them is better. That, that's pretty much all you need to know. Uh, so, if you don't like dollies, dallies or qualies, that's fine. Think about another measure of health that combines survival and quality of life that's got some relationship with people's preferences. Uh, it'll look like a dally or a quali, but you don't need to call it either, okay? So just have something else in mind. I'm, I'm not really bothered what you call it. We've, we've, we've done an awful lot of work to try and marshal evidence to assess the health benefits for the population. In this case, 200,000 dallies averted for this eligible population and an awful lot of work to estimate the additional costs. It's going to cost us £20 million at cost C1. We can, if you like, summarise that as this delivers as a dally for every $100 we spend. Is it worthwhile? Do we think it's worthwhile? Well, the key question is what else we could have done with that $20 million of resources? What else could have been done with it? Whether we're having to find that from existing commitments, in other words, we will be disinvesting in something else, or whether this is new money, we could have done something else with that new money as well. In other words, we need an assessment of those health opportunity costs. Let's imagine that we believe in this particular healthcare system, every $200 will avert a dally somewhere else on average. What does that actually mean? Well, you could say the ice is less than the threshold. I don't think that's particularly compelling. What we're actually saying is that the health benefits exceed the health that we are likely to lose elsewhere as a consequence of those additional costs. In other words, the two we expect to gain, 200, uh, avert 200,000 uh, dallies. Elsewhere, we could have averted 100,000, so we've got a net health benefit of 100,000 net dallies averted. So it's cost-effective because overall we improve population health. Yes, we should approve it if what we want to do is to improve health. What if it costs a little bit more? Now it costs 40 million, it's exactly the same intervention. We gain 200, we avert 200,000 dallies, uh, but elsewhere we could have averted 200,000 dallies. The net gain is zero. 40 million is the most we can possibly pay, we can afford to pay for the benefits on offer. It also tells us something else. It tells us that if you like the gains from this intervention, the value of this intervention in terms of how much a healthcare system can afford to pay for it, if we're, the current costs are 20 million, the value, the additional value to the healthcare system can also be valued at 20 million pounds. That's how much resource the healthcare system would have to find to, to deliver similar net health benefits. What if it costs a bit more? Now it's 60 million, it's $300 a dally greater than the threshold, what does that actually mean? It means that we avert 200,000, but elsewhere we could have averted 300,000. Actually approving and implementing this programme at that cost, at that uh, cost effectiveness threshold would reduce health outcomes overall. So cost effectiveness is really about what is going to improve health outcomes overall, reflecting the fact that there are other ways in which we can use resources which would have improved health. Once we start to see cost effectiveness in that way, and once we've got an estimate of those health opportunity costs, we no longer need to work with these cost per dally ratios, which are particularly unhelpful in many circumstances. We can start to express things in more useful metrics of value, either the net health effects or the net value to the healthcare system. This is the same example, but now 
four different, four different uh, interventions, uh, non-mutually exclusive interventions, each with their uh, uh, with the population, their ISA, the DALIs that they will avert, and the healthcare system costs. What you can see is we've got from intervention one to four, cost per DALI starts at $300 per, per DALI, down to number four, which is actually cost saving. Imagine that our threshold is $200 per DALI. What does this mean? Well, it means that intervention one is not cost effective and would reduce health outcomes overall. It's not valuable to the healthcare system. We simply can't afford it. There are better things to do with our money. Intervention two, we might regard as cost effective, but you know what? The net health benefits are zero. It shouldn't be a priority for implementation at all. In fact, any resource that we devote to implementation and scale-up effort for this particular intervention will reduce health outcomes. The real priority here, of course, is intervention four. Not only does it improve health, we actually save healthcare resources which can be used to improve health outcomes for other, uh, for other, for other citizens. So we can express the value of making sure we implement things either in health terms or in healthcare system resource terms. It tells us something about the maximum we could devote to implementation efforts. What are the consequences of getting this wrong? What about if we have a threshold that's too high? In other words, one that does not really reflect opportunity costs. Well, as we've seen, if we do adopt thresholds that are too high, we will reduce health outcomes overall because we will adopt interventions where the benefits do not exceed the health opportunity costs elsewhere in the healthcare system. We also underestimate the value of increased healthcare expenditure. Uh, we did some work with the Ministry of Health in Malawi and on the way there I realised I'd forgotten my tie and I had to buy the cheapest tie at Terminal 5 at Heathrow. That tie cost me £57. I'm not wearing it today because it's too warm. Uh, I usually do. It's a very nice tie but it's not worth £57. £57 is more than it cost to avert a dally in Malawi according to our current estimates. Now, if that's not a reason to uh, sustain continued overseas support, donor assistance, I don't know what is. So, you know, having an estimate of the threshold that's too high actually underestimates the value of being able to continue to provide that support. I think it, doesn't, it undermines accountability of expenditure decisions. The, the other thing that happens is that we... If we think the threshold is 500 but health opportunity costs are $200 per DALI, then A, we end up adopting interventions which reduce health outcomes overall. We underestimate what we could have achieved with an additional $10 million. We would, achieve, we would have earned 50,000, not 20,000 DALIs. It also means that we underestimate the impact of donor restrictions. Donated funds of 10 million that are restricted to interventions of $500 a DALI, uh, instead of uh, generating benefits of 50,000 DALIs averted, we only get 20. In other words, there's a health opportunity cost of 30,000 DALIs that we did not avert because of those restrictions. Now, there might be a good reason, but we need a reason to throw away 30,000 DALIs. So I think telling it as it is, is really important in terms of accountability for a whole range of decisions, not just those within, uh, within country, but also for global bodies. It also enables us to think about the opportunity cost of constraints, as I've shown. We can start to see where the value lies in making sure we figure out why it is we can't implement this really important programme and then devote resources to it. It's not a decision rule, it's just a benchmark. We want to see the net benefit associated with a range of investments and disinvestments on the table. By using it as a benchmark, it helps assist the incremental reallocation of resources to improve health outcomes overall. Is it restricted to health? Well, certainly not. What we can do is to set out the attributes that an investment offers, in this case, it's an intervention where the benefits are $200,000 averted, we offers financial protection, it does little for equity. The impact elsewhere, outside on the rest of the economy, net production, 60 million. We've got four attributes. What does that look like? Well, we need to compare it to the opportunity cost. What else could have been done with that 60 million of investment? Well, it might look like that. 
if our, if our health opportunity cost is $200 per day, then we would expect to lose 300 uh, 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 300,000 dallies elsewhere. We might not offer financial protection, but we might improve equity, but we might also gain $40 million worth of net production elsewhere in the economy. What's the trade? That's really for, that's a political question for those that are accountable and responsible to their populations. Is it worth it? Is a gain of 20 million pounds worth a loss of 200,000 dallies? I'm very pushed for time, so I'm going to press on. We can also inform development decisions. What is the value of developing a new technology to address issues in global health? We can figure out what the value is in terms of health outcomes, uh, but for different types of technology in development and how that is distributed across low and middle income countries. We can also express that in terms of the monetary, the global monetary value and how that is distributed. If we know something about the investment required, then we can express those developments in terms of return on investment. I am very pushed for time, so I'm going to press on. So the key question is, what is this threshold? What are health opportunity costs? Three ways in which people have tried to express this. They're just norms. Nice thresholds are just norms that describe how they made decisions. WHO thresholds, until recently, have just been, if you like, norms. None of them really any empirical foundation. We could look to how much people of con people's consumption are willing to, they are willing to give up to improve their health, in other words, the demand side, or we could look to evidence about the supply side, what healthcare systems currently deliver with additional resources. And we're able to do that because there is quite a wide literature that's estimated the impact of changes in healthcare expenditure on health outcomes. That's quite a wide literature. We've taken one particular, particularly good example which, and re-estimated uh, uh, outcome elasticities on mortality for, uh, for 127 countries. If we link those impacts of expenditure on mortality to survival effects and disability effects, this is kind of what it looks like for 127, well, this is what it looks like for the lower middle income countries. Those rising lines are the one times and three times GDP per capita. In other words, much lower than those uh, previous WHO norms. We can express that instead of by GDP per capita, let's express it by under five mortality rates. What you can see is that for some countries, actually those those, uh, those cost per dollars are very low when they're under five mortality is very high, which is exactly what we'd expect. I'm going to try and sum up because I know I'm under pressure from the chair quite rightly. There are challenges. There are challenges for empirical estimation. It is challenging even with, within country data, which we have in the UK. But it's especially challenging using cross-country data for a whole range of pr uh, issues. But some assessment is unavoidable. These assessments will be made within healthcare systems and they will be made by global bodies implicitly whenever they make recommendations, make purchasing decisions or development decisions. Our task is to have some explicit assessment based on the evidence such as it is. Demonstrate how the existing, albeit limited, evidence can be marshalled and provide a useful start point for some assessment and refinement. Uh, that's all I've got to say about that. <laughs> I have another slide, but... Do I take questions or am I, am I done? Uh, no, I think if we hold all the questions yep. till the end and we'll have an open, open panel discussion. So next up is uh, Lisa, Dr. Lisa Robinson. So thank you all. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk briefly about the concepts that underlie these demand-based thresholds, uh, current or historical practices, and then some opportunities for improvement. Um, it's really interesting for me to be working on this stuff because I'm primarily a benefit cost analysis person. I dabble in cost effectiveness analysis. Uh, occasionally, um, and this is a place where the two really intersect. If you have a demand-based threshold, um, you could just multiply it through by the number of dollars and qualities and have a benefit-cost analysis with some caveats about uh, exactly how to do it. 
Um, the idea here is that the threshold is intended to reflect individual willingness to pay per quality or per dolly. Um, I think this information is often informative even if you don't use it for decision making because understanding how the population that's affected by an intervention values it can help you think about uh, implementation challenges and many other issues. Um, historically, though, we haven't had much data on how people really uh, value a quality or a dolly, so we've instead derived these thresholds from the values from mortality risk reductions. Um, this uh, slide uh, violates every principle of what you're supposed to do with your slides, but uh, um, I wasn't really sure how many people here were familiar with these concepts. There's a lot of confusion about them, so I'm going to run through them quickly, and those of you who already know this can... Uh, take time to, I don't know what, check your phone. Um, but um, what we're trying to, the starting point for these is what's usually referenced as the value of persistical life. Um, there are many times in my career where I've wanted to find who coined that phrase and just choke them because it gets us into all kinds of trouble. Um, what we're really talking about here is starting with a estimate of individual willingness to pay to reduce your own mortality risk within a small, within a short time period. Um, you do things every day that demonstrate that you are willing to pay to reduce these risks. You might drive slower, you might buy a protective measure or an airbag on your car, or a helmet for bicycle riding, um, whatever. It's not the value that somebody else is placing on saving your life. Um, so there's a calculation here. Um, uh, if I'm willing to pay $900 to reduce my risk by one in 10,000, say in the current year, my VSL is $9 million. I picked those numbers intentionally because 9 million is about where the best estimates of the VSL in the US are right now, um, which means on average a US resident is likely to be willing to pay $900. The one in 10,000 comes from um, most of the studies look at uh, risk changes around the range of one in 10,000, one in 100,000, because a lot of policies reduce your risk by about that much on average. Um, the uh, idea here is that the VSL um, accounts for all of the effects of that risk change, uh, uh, avoiding lost earnings, avoiding additional medical costs, um, uh, the joy of life itself, delaying pain and suffering. You're, you are going to die eventually, but at least you don't have to do it quite as soon. Um, and uh, these numbers almost always uh, exceed human capital estimates by a large margin, not surprisingly, because there's a lot of other things in them. Um, we don't have good studies of the value that people place on a year of life extension. There have been a few studies, but they've had real challenges because people have real trouble envisioning this idea that by reducing my, my uh, risk this year, that's going to extend my life um, over future periods. So when you do these studies, a lot of times um, you see things like people, no matter what you tell them, they're thinking, oh, this is going to increase my life expectancy at this point when I'm really frail and I'm you know, miserable otherwise. So you get these sort of bizarre numbers. Um, so in the interim, until we can figure out how to do better studies, what we do is we usually take a VSL, we divide it by the number of life years remaining for the average individual study, and we calculate a constant VSL Y. So this 9 million um, translates into about a, a $400,000 VSL Y. This is, again, for the US. Um, you could instead divide by future qualities. Instead of by future life years, you'd get a bigger constant because the number of qualities, um, or well, it gets a little bit complicated when we talk about dollars because of the in inverse scale, but the number of qualities, uh, 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 because your quality of life uh, decreases as you get older, the number of qualities that you're dividing by is uh, smaller than the number of life years. If we are doing benefit-cost analysis, our next step would be to take this constant, multiply it by the number of life years remaining um, to estimate a total value for each person affected. So we'd have this sort of declining scale where uh, we've got high values for young people and uh, much lower values for older people. The problem is that the research on willingness to pay doesn't uh, show that sort of pattern. What we find in high-income countries is that values for children are about twice um, the values for uh, uh, average-aged adult. Uh, for working people, there's a sort of inverse U function um, in many of these studies that peaks um, at roughly middle age. And then for older people, people old, over age 65, so in the US, uh, people are not working. 
Um, uh, the research is really unsettled. Uh, it's not clear whether values are remaining the same, increasing or decreasing. Um, all of the things I just said, even in the U.S., the data, are, the research is a little bit inconsistent. We're not entirely positive that that's the pattern that these values follow. Um, but it does suggest that this approach of taking the uh, uh, taking a constant and, and multiplying it by the number of lifers remaining um, is uh, only a rough proxy for how people really value these risks. Um, uh, Carl mentioned the one times one and three times GDP per capita thresholds. Um, I think most of you probably know that these are based on work by the Commission on uh, Macroeconomics and Health. Um, they weren't intended to be firm estimates. Um, they were based on some very old research um, that would have, in fact, um, supported higher thresholds. Um, it does raise the question, though, of why do we use GDP multipliers? And the issue is that we, because these values represent your willingness to pay for these small risk reductions instead of for all the other things you could spend that money on, we would expect that they would decrease as your income decreases because as you get poorer and poorer, you're under more pressure to spend money on other things that are much more important than these, these very small risk reductions. Um, so these multipliers are an attempt to take into account um, that relationship. Uh, one thing that I think uh, we could easily do is update these values to at least reflect more recent research. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, there's obviously lots of decisions to make along the way, but we start off with a base VSL estimate. Um, we convert it to a VSLY doing the sort of simple math I just described, and then we adjust for income. The main drawback here is that we're continuing to assume that uh, the value of a life year is a constant. I mean, the value of a quality dollar is a constant, and that it's equal to the VSLY. Um, uh, since uh, Paul's telling me I have five minutes left, I will try and uh, just hit some high points here. Um, the, um, we have been doing some work to see how the VSL is estimated in uh, different countries. Right now, there's two dominant approaches. Uh, one, uh, I should say, how the VSL esti is estimated when we do these transfers across countries. There's two dominant approaches right now. One's to start off with the U.S. VSL. Another is to start off with an OECD VSL. These numbers are quite different, um, and they're different not so much because the preferences among these countries differ, the U.S. versus all the OECD countries, but because the researchers made different choices about what studies to select and how to combine the results of the studies. So this is a methodological issue. It's not an issue of what the underlying preferences are. Divide by uh, U.S. Life, ex by life expectancy for the population studied, so if you're using these numbers, either U.S. or OECD. Um, and I just put the math in for the uh, U.S. VSLY that I calculated earlier, um, and you, as you can see, at least a much higher multiplier than the one, time, one to three times GDP. Um, we then adjust for income. Um, we uh, need income estimates for both the population from which we're taking the VSL and the population to which we're applying it. We usually use GDP or G GNI because they're so commonly available. Uh, the other thing, though, that we need is an estimate of the extent to which the VSL is likely to change as your income changes. Um, that's where things, I think, get a little bit more complicated because um, if we assume that the elasticity is constant over the range that we're using in our extrapolation, um, it's an exponential formula, which means that something that might look like a small change in the elasticity can have a fairly large impact on the values. Um, one thing to keep in mind, too, when you're thinking about this formula is that the GDP per capita multiplier is going to be constant across countries only if you assume, or across income levels, only if you assume that the elasticity is one. Um, Recent work is sort of coalescing around estimates that are close to one, but as I said, small differences can make, small differences in elasticity can make uh, fairly large differences in the, uh, in the values. Um, this work that uh, I've cited here um, uh, has been used, has recommended using an elasticity of 0.8 when you're going across different countries, all of which are high income and elasticity of uh, 1.2 when you're going across countries that have uh, bigger differences in income. This doesn't address um, the problem, the, uh, the value of mortality, change in mortality risk. It's likely to be different than the value of a dollar or a quality because you have some disability and morbidity in the dollar and quality measures. Um, 
there is uh, an increasing amount of work that uh, um, allows us to estimate uh, evaluation function for qualities, um, and the big question there is whether it's applicable to valleys too. Um, the good news is that um, there is a lot more work being done on the VSL in low and middle income countries. Uh, we're working on reviewing that research now as part of a separate project. Um, we're also continuing to work on evaluation functions for qualities, and Peter and his group at Tufts are starting to do some work on the equivalence of top DALIs and qualities, which will help us think about whether those valuation functions are applicable to DALIs. At the moment, we don't have any research, as far as I know, about willingness to pay per, per DALI. Um, the uh, um, other thing is that uh, we, so I said in the last slide that we have something like 60 studies of uh, the VSL in low and middle income countries. Those studies, there's what, 130, 140 low and middle income countries. Those studies only address a small fraction of them and some are not very well done. Um, we expect that people's willingness to pay for a DALI, a quality, uh, uh, for morbidity, mortality risk reductions is going to vary across countries for things that have nothing to do with income, age, life expectancy. There's cultural factors, there's health systems, there's all kinds of things that affect people's, uh, people's preferences. Um, so I think the strongest need here is to do a lot more studies in a lot more countries um, to better understand what those preferences are. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so today I'll be presenting some preliminary findings that uh, on, on research that I've been doing with some colleagues at Priceless, and I'll acknowledge my colleague here, Nicola Stacy, who's been heavily involved in the, in this work. And we're trying to estimate a margin, the marginal return to healthcare spending in South Africa using an instrumental variable approach. Um, before I delve into the crux of, of the, the matter, I just thought to mention a, a few things that I think are important to note about the uh, profile of South Africa that is important for, the, uh, for this uh, um, work. And um, so South Africa has nine provincial governments um, and, and each of them are responsible. They have complete autonomy over how their budget or the national the revenue they receive through national transfers. They have complete autonomy how they allocate those, those resources. And so it's a kind of fiscal federalism system where the national government has very little control over how the provinces allocate their resources. Um, so just a bit of motivation into the study. Um, there's currently a number of uh, consultations being held by the national government to set up a, um, a, a Haiti agency that would be responsible for making decisions on what gets included into the, um, the National Health Insurance Health Benefit Package design. And such decisions like um, uh, Carl has uh, outlined earlier on would re require some kind of cost effectiveness analysis, maybe not the only criteria for making such decisions, but certainly an important criteria. And, and a cost effectiveness threshold to determine whether um, such an intervention represent good value for money. Um, we've heard the, uh, the WHO threshold of one to three times GDP per capita might not truly represent the opportunity cost of what um, it is being given up in the, in the health system that, that operates with a fixed um, budget. And so uh, there's a growing body of evidence now starting to emerge on cost effectiveness thresholds that try to capture the opportunity cost imposed on the health healthcare system. And, and these thresholds um, typically are estimated indirectly using uh, estimates of the effect of health spending on health outcomes, um, applying multi-country level data analysis. And while you know, there's been quite robust evidence um, using multi-country level data, um, sometimes this might mark some important contextual nuances uh, within the healthcare system that would be um, important in determining both the data generating process and as a result, the relationship between health spending and health outcome 
and, and inconsistencies or, or perhaps differences between the way different countries collect data on health expenditure or health outcome might represent some methodological challenges in, in pulling this data together. And so, um, the, you know, while it, the, like, I'm, I'm not in any way putting down this multi-country um, analysis, but I'm just saying that it might be better to use um, in-country data um, to try to uh, estimate this, these effects. And so what we're trying to do that for South Africa, uh, looking at under five mortality and adult mortality, and then the hope is to use this estimate to estimate a cost effectiveness threshold for South Africa. So uh, our model looks like this, where we model health outcome as a function of health expenditure and a set of covariate. This is at a, a provincial level. Um, but the problem with health, this model is that the health expenditure is likely to be endogenous and also there's some reverse causality um, between um, mortality and health expenditure. So not only is ex health expenditure predicting mortality, but the relationship could go the other way around. And we try to control for this using an instrumental variable approach. We find an instrument that is correlated with health expenditure, but not correlated with outcome variable, and as a result, not directly correlated with health outcomes. And the, the, the idea is that this the impact of this instrument on health outcome is only going to its effect on health expenditure. So more formally, um, the, we, we find a set of instruments Z, and denoted here by Z, that is not correlated with error terms in the first and second equations, uh, and it's correlated with health, health outcomes. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take a few minutes now to describe how we, are, we, we derive a, a instrumental variable. It, it's mostly um, um, obtained from the, the, what is called the provincial equitable share formula, which the national government uses in transferring funds or in dividing revenue across, across the nine provinces. Um, the, re the provincial governments have very little scope to to generate their own revenue and to depend on, on national transfers, which come in two forms. There's either the equitable share, which constitute 80% of the total um, um, receipts from the national government and conditional grants, which account for 20%. And with the, with the equitable shares, they're completely dependent. Uh, the, the, the provinces have complete autonomy over how they, they allocate these resources, but they have limited um, autonomy over how they use the conditional grants. They have to use the conditional grants as stipulated by, um, uh, uh, on the conditions stipulated by the national government. So we've got, um, just because I had uh, to describe this a bit further, we've got the national consolidated revenue here. The national government retains 48%, allocates 643 to all the provinces and 9% to the municipals. So this 43% is then divided across all the nine, nine provinces using what is called uh, the provincial equitable share, which has got six components. And 48% of that is, uh, is transferred to the provinces through what is called the education component, 27% through the health component, and, and, and so on. So for example, the health component would and so each province gets a, comp a share of these components depending on, on the level of the demand and the need for, for public services within the province. So the, for example, the health allocation is dependent on the, the proportion of uninsured population adjusted for the risk profile of the population within each province and, and also the a demand component which is based on the level of utilization of primary and hospital healthcare services. So, here we've got our nine provinces. Eastern Capes get uh, um, just under 14% of the health component. Um, Free states get 5%. Houteng and KwaZulu-Natal get 21%, the biggest share, and so on um, to Western Cape. The same thing is, have, happens with the other components. Um, education component is divided across all provinces based on the school en enrollment of 15 to 17 year olds within the provinces. So again, KwaZulu Natal and Houteng get the highest proportion here. Um, the basic share is, is dependent on the po population share within the province and poverty on the proportion of poor population within each province and economic activity is dependent on the GDP per capita. So. We make use of um, our instruments here, uh, the total budget, provincial budget. 
and, and also the demand for services in, in other sectors because we feel that these would determine the size of the health uh, of the of the healthcare budget. Um, yeah, I put up a list of our variables. So, in addition to um, uh, the the health expenditure, um, health spending, and the instruments, we also control for GDP per capita of each province and the medical aid coverage, which we feel directly impact on health outcomes and these are controlled in the second in the second stage of the instrumental variable approach. Um, our, all our outcome variables are estimated at the log scale. Um, in terms of the, the where we obtained our data, this is one of the crucial challenges we found in, in doing in, in, in these studies where, where we obtained data and we've had to plow through government documents and provincial documents collected by the National Treasury to try to work out what the healthcare spending is for each province and the instrumental variables. Uh, mortality and, and two other controls were a bit easier to obtain. Um, mortality was obtained through the, what the, the Home Affairs the, um, Debt Registry, and, and we used the General Household Survey for most of our uh, other coverage. So I present a few results here um, on the five mortality health expenditure and on the five mortality the relationship is not very clear here. But when we look at adult mortality, both female and male mortality, over time, health expenditure has been rising and, and, and adults, both male and adult female mortality has been declining. Um, here I present some results from uh, our, our, our estimation strategy. Um, I present OLS results where we assume exogeneity of, of health spending and IV um, the instrument result from the instrumental variable approach where we assume that health spending is endogenous. What we find is that the OLS estimates, underestimates the impact of, of, um, the, uh, of health spending on health outcome and the results at the bottom of the screen show that our, our, variable, our instrumental variables are both valid and, and relevant. So we, we I would rely on the IV estimate. So in summary, um, a 1% increase in health spending is um, results in a 0.6% decrease in under five mortality, 1.2% decrease in adult female mortality, and 1% decrease in male mortality. If we compare it to other studies, which um, um, Hal mentioned a bit uh, earlier in his presentation, one of the studies that have been used um, quite a lot in estimating cost-effectiveness threshold for low middle income countries is Bukhari et al. paper, which uses multi-country level data and, and they find out that a 1% increase in health spending in South Africa um, is associated with a 0.3% decrease, which is about 50% less than what we estimated. So, I mean, th there's been several um, criticism over the use of, uh, of, um, of in, of these data, but, but that's not the, the point I want to stress here. Um, if indeed these other studies have underestimated the marginal returns to health spending, this will result in an overestimation of the cost effectiveness threshold and, and all the problems um, that Carl has outlined uh, uh, that could arise from overestimating the cost effectiveness threshold. I would like to stress in conclusion that this is still a work in progress. Uh, and before we can truly, um, you know, say that our studies compared like for like with these other studies, we need to do a bit more. Um, for instance, we've assumed that, we've, um, that all the other unobservable factors that affect both mortality and health spending are time invariant, but, but there are potentially other time invariant <laughs> provincial level characteristics that we might be able to control for. And then the second thing is the fiscal federalism. We've assumed that provinces will allocate resources across sectors, but within the health sector and across health and across other sectors based on the national um, provincial equitable shares. But that's not, that may not necessarily be the case because they have complete autonomy over how they allocate resources and using provincial level data might be a stronger instrument in this case. Thank you.
Thanks, Gemma. So we'll now have a discussion from uh, Professor Dean Jamieson, followed by the uh, open um, panel and, and Q&A. Um, I don't know if it's possible to put the put, put this up it's for after um, the next talk. Well, good morning to all of you, and thank you to the three speakers. I think we've had a very uh, rich set of presentations, and I would like to stress at least my own view that um, the, all the presentations deal with a particularly important topic uh, in health policy and health economics uh, as um, national budgets get tighter, as development assistance budgets get tighter, um, there's an increasing need, I think, uh, in policy formulation to have a clear sense um, for intersectoral resource allocation function of governments, um, how um, desirable uh, allocation to the health sector is. And I think, uh, as our last speaker mentioned, uh, related uh, sectors, water supply, sanitation, education that affect health. I'd like to call attention to two or perhaps three points um, that were raised this morning. Um, uh, and that point to, uh, two of the points uh, point to a very different communities, intellectual communities, uh, approaching this question of valuation of uh, changes in health outcomes. Uh, the BCA community that um, Lisa Robinson's uh, uh, talk uh, described um, uses, uh, for the most part, um, observed willingness to pay studies um, to some extent, um, um, asked willingness to pay uh, studies as well at the individual level and the contrast then between supply and demand side sharp most cost effectiveness analysis in health um, is as we all know um, put into terms that are either real health outcomes under five deaths averted uh, adult female deaths averted or put into some aggregate um, attempt at a health measure like a quali or dally um, and then uh, that is that for resource allocation within the health sector. Uh, so we have the, these alternative approaches and one of the, I think, distinctive differences in the cultures is how they treat the value of mortality reduction at different ages. And um, in particular, uh, Lisa raised that issue. Um, the implicit in both the quality and the dally is um, a years of life lost um, value judgment uh, for um, coming to this, uh, to an assessment. And there's um, a value judgment um, that emerges in, from the BCA literature, uh, as um, Lisa stressed, almost all of the studies uh, are not really about, even about the value of a death at any age. They're typically, and there's a great deal of heterogeneity, about deaths at around age 40. Um, 30 to 40. Um, and there's then uh, a value judgment in the BCA community of treating um, all deaths or all deaths, say, between 5 and 70 of more or less equal value. So like, there's this huge difference in culture that I think is one of the purposes of our work and, and that um, the South Africa uh, study, I think, is valuable in explicitly pointing to both the causes and the value of uh, mortality at uh, different ages. Um, just uh, one uh, final comment on uh, numerators. Um, one can think of the opportunity cost approach as um, in a, a systematic empirical attempt, at least I think we can think of it that way, to provide an alternative numerator to money uh, uh, for making intersectoral uh, comparisons, and importantly, for making comparisons within the health sector 
around things that the health sector does that don't produce dallies or qualities, such as provision of contraceptive services, such as prevention of stillbirths, such as uh, improvement of IQ levels where the distribution of IQ in a population has been adversely affected by dietary or um, health uh, considerations. Likewise for stature, palliative care. So there are a lot of things that a health system does that don't produce health as measured in dallies or qualities. Um, and what I'm hearing uh, Carl suggest in terms of the numerator for value is when we talk about a health system's, let's say, provision of um, so many millions of couple years of contraception, uh, on the, um, then we can talk about that cost not only in dollars, it's not $11 per couple year of contraception, it is 0.02 human lives per couple year of contraception. It focuses our mind on a numerator that can be extended, my point here, is far beyond the health sector. We can talk about a value far beyond the health sector. So this issue around numerator and use, the issues around age, um, seem to me to be uh, central ones that the panelists have addressed this morning in ways that um, give us a lot of new information and insights. And um, I just want to thank them once again. I'll just invite all the speakers up to the front. <laughs> and we have two microphones at either side um, if you have any questions if you wouldn't mind coming forward uh, and and using microphones at, 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 at either aisle um, so so I can see Carl's eager to, uh, to, to jump in. Do you want to? Um, yeah, it was, it was just about a South African study, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And um, just to say, it kind of chimes with the work that we've been recently doing for the Department of Health in the UK. So just as you're using instruments based on the funding formula, there was a paper published last year by Andrews, which demonstrated that you could estimate an all-cause model using similar instruments, which are much more secure. And we've been applying that to our data that our original work's based on uh, at, a, at a disease level. We've been able to replicate that work. Our worry is with the all-cause models is that we've got aggregation bias. We've been able to apply the same thing to the disease-specific models and we find exactly that. I'm sorry this is all a bit geeky, but I'm quite excited because it's chiming exactly with what, what you found, which is that we also fear that the cross-country work, there's a massive level of aggregation bias in there. We're, we're underestimating the elasticities based on the cross-country work. When we look at the UK work, we are showing much higher elasticities in the UK. We're showing higher elasticities on all-cause models, which is the same as what you've got using the same instruments. But when we do it, when we use the same type of instruments, but at a disease level, in other words, we reduce, we eliminate the aggregation bias from all-cause, the elasticities are even higher. So, uh, yeah, it's just a comment that we should kind of, it's a shame the other session where James will be presenting that work is, is on at the same time, but we're, we're working in very similar directions. Well, fascinating. So if you'd like to introduce yourself before making questions. Um, is this on? Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Warren Stevens, Precision Global Health. Um, I'd love to start by saying I totally agree that thresholds should be empirical and they've been kind of anecdotal and normative, as you say, for too long. but. I do also have a few concerns, and I know it's very early days about how we're doing this, but one that came to me actually when you were chatting 
is about efficiency. And I was envisioning a situation where you've got two countries, two systems, with maybe similar kind of levels of willingness to pay if we take it from that angle, but one very inefficient delivery and one maybe more so efficient. Obviously, the former would have a lower empirical threshold. And so theoretically, you're saying uh, they would be less open to new technologies or they would have higher standards for introducing new technologies. And you've got an inefficient system, less able to introduce more new technology, which seems like a, a potentially a, a kind of weird, perverse incentive. So that's one thing. The second thing is I worry a little bit about averages in the sense that Oftentimes, it sounds like, and I may be getting it wrong, so do let me know if I am, it sounds like you're generating an average cost effectiveness threshold from the opportunity cost of the healthcare expenditure in a particular system. And in reality, we don't change half of our healthcare expenditure each year. And so it seems like more in theory, you should be looking to find the, let's say we change 10% of our health expenditure with new technologies every year. It should be kind of the 90th percentile that should be more of a threshold. Not necessarily for everything, but it's something that, you know, the average is often not the best arbiter when you're looking at introducing, because, you know, it could be that the average is $200 per dally, but there could be loads of healthcare expenditures that are delivering at 1,000 or something. So, uh, and then the final thing is uh, distribution. Uh, again, the use of averages, in reality, as we know, a lot of interventions and a lot of current healthcare spending varies in its ability to generate outcomes that are at a, a particularly different cost. So again, it's an arbiter, it seems arbitrary to use an average when the true complexity of distribution of interventions are, are. and again, I know this is very early stages, but I'd just love to get the panel's view on, on those issues. Yeah, do you want, there's a few questions there. Do you want, so should we, if, if you'd like to respond to those panel and then we'll take uh, a few more questions. Could I, could I just have a go at the average versus marginal just quick? The stuff we've estimated in the UK, the stuff that presented from Bakori, the stuff from South Africa, it is trying to estimate the margin, it's not the average, okay. because what the data we're looking at, we're estimating based on variations in expenditure. So we're estimating the effect of a change in expenditure. Uh, in the UK, we've been able to do additional work to say, okay, well, what is the scale of that variation? And what does that tell us about how these health opportunity costs respond to scale of budget impact? In terms of the variation we're looking at there, it's less, much less than 1% of total budget, but it does enable us to start to get at that. So if you like, we're looking at the, we're looking at the margin on average across our healthcare system. The Bacori works looking at the margin on average across the healthcare systems adjusting for covariates. So we are getting at that. Just the other one on the efficiency, I completely agree with you that understanding what your health opportunity costs are doesn't mean that you're done. It, all it's telling you is what you're currently getting for a change in expenditure given the way your healthcare system is, warts, inefficiencies, and really daft stuff uh, together. It's not the end of it. What you need to do is to make sure that you keep a look at uh, uh, disinvestments that need to be made, unexploited, good investments that are available. And once you do that, you need to re-estimate what you're getting at the margin periodically. So, you know, it's not a one-shot deal that fixes the healthcare system. It's a piece of information that helps you iterate towards a better, more efficient healthcare system. Is there a concern also there that uh, there's a particular intervention, an estimate of an ISA in one healthcare system where the empirical estimate of the threshold is higher, that intervention would be deemed cost-effective. In another, more efficient system where the threat empirical estimate of the threshold is lower, that intervention may not be deemed cost-effective. So is there a, a, a messaging issue we need to... Um, be aware of uh, yeah, uh, from this work. I mean, the, the, the other thing that I'd like to see is that, I mean, I did have the slide up, but I ran out of time, is that when we're thinking about an investment, it's not just the investment versus what we know from the aggregate data about the health opportunity cost, but it's lining that up alongside all the other things that we could do or that we currently do. Uh, in other words, we use this as a process of investment and disinvestment, if you see what I mean. And, uh, uh, and we need both, because if all we do is compare an investment to a potential disinvestment, then both those things might be bad ideas. The, the disinvestment should be made anyway, and this new investment isn't good value anyway. Are you, are you getting me here? Yeah. So, so all I'm saying is that having a threshold doesn't fix everything, but it's an important part of trying to fix it. 
Um, I'm Gesine Meyerath from the Health Economics and Epidemiology Research Office at WITS. My question is for Ioma. Um, I know this is work in progress, and <clears throat> I think it's, it's very impressive um, uh, how far you've got. Um, I wonder if one big other exogenous factor that you didn't include was the um, provincial allocation formula between provinces, which I think you're right, is, is supposed to be based on notions of burden of disease, but I don't think there is actually very much data in how it is allocated in the end. So my question is twofold. The one is, um, can you say anything about the variance of those elasticities across provinces? I don't know if that's work you have already done. It looked a bit like that in the graphs. And the second is, and that's probably for the future and, and might not be easy to answer right away, um, whether your work can actually be used to uh, improve on the current provincial allocation formula in the future. Thanks. Maybe take uh, another question and then uh, Gemma can, can I come on. Sure. I, I had a question for, for Carl, and, and I wanted to give you another chance to tell me why decisions would come out differently versus in the net benefit approach versus the, the threshold approach. Because your example today really showed I would have voted for the same policies with either approach. I, I need you to give me some intuition on why it matters. Okay, you would like to respond first. Yeah, oh, yes. Hey, so, um, thank you for the, for the question. Um, in terms of estimating the variance of the threshold across, across provinces, what, what we've used is to actually make use of the differences in, in the way resources are allocated across province to identify a, a effect. And, and we're working with very, very limited um, data. For, you know, we've got nine provinces and um, trying to estimate a cost-effectiveness ratio for each part, it's not, it's not going to be um, a possible. What, what we might try to do is to estimate a cost-effectiveness threshold across, across the different sectors, the public and the private sector, because, because of the dual system that South Africa operates. I think that's, a, that's probably a, a, a more um, important to, to try to understand how, how that the, the, the different spending across the different sectors would affect, affect um, the, the, the thresholds. Um, uh, in, you're, you're correct that the provincial equitable share formula doesn't capture the burden of disease. Um, it, it basically relies on the needs and demand. So, so areas that have higher demand for services, um, not necessarily as a result of the body of disease, get, get a, a, higher, a higher share of the total transfers. And, and the, the, while that, that re represents a problem in itself, um, I think it's, um, it's beyond the, the scope of this work in trying to adjust or make um, recommendations on how the, the, the a provincial equitable share could be made more equitable in terms of the body of, of disease. Um, but I, I think for the purposes of this, uh, of this study, what would be interesting to, would be to look at how provinces allocate resources across sectors within provinces. Very little is known about how that is done. We know how the national government transfers funds to the provinces, but because of fiscal autonomy, they have complete um, um, uh, responsibility on how resources are allocated. So a, a province might decide to spend all the allocations they get from the national government on education and completely ignore health. Um, um, and, and you know, so that, that's, that's up to the provinces to decide. And, and I think using that allocation mechanism within provinces to, to, to as an instrument for our model, I think that might, might capture things a bit better but we don't know how that's currently being done. Uh, just on the, uh, the, the issue around ratios, I, I guess there's three things about ratios that are problematic. Firstly, they tend to be simply categorical. It's below the threshold, so it's cost effective. Great, woohoo, we're all happy. But actually, if it's just below the threshold, who cares? Uh, we get a zero net health benefit. We shouldn't be spending anything on trying to scale it up. That's number one. Number two, you're quite right. The example I used was an example where actually the priority for implementation did follow the cost per dally. It's very easy to construct other examples where it's exactly the reverse, and maybe I should have used one of those. And the reason why it's exactly the reverse, can be exactly the reverse, is because ratios tell you nothing about scale. 
So you can have uh, an intervention which has got the highest ISA, but below the threshold, which offers the greatest net health benefits because of the scale of the impact it can have on population health and ought to be your priority for implement implementation efforts over and above other interventions which have got a lower ISA. So, you know, I think there were reasons historically why we used ISA as a way of communicating things, but to be perfectly honest, they've become shackles on our wrists uh, now. They're, they're not the best way to communicate. And I guess that comes to my third point, which is the reason why I do think we should be moving away from ISIS and starting to talk about net health benefit and value to the healthcare system is because we have a duty to arm decision makers and politicians who are going to have to make these very difficult decisions with the kind of means of communicating to the people they are accountable to why this makes sense and why this is an ethical way to organize our healthcare system. And if the only thing that we can tell them is, look, the ice is above the threshold, you can't do it, Minister. <coughs> try saying that on Radio 4 in the UK. You know, try telling that to the Daily Mail. Try, telling, try saying that on Fox News, see how far you get. Now, if we, if we, can't, if we can't communicate that, with our tools, then there's something wrong with the tools we're using and we need to find better ways of making sure we make that absolutely crystal clear because it's the only way that we're going to have a sustainable, accountable, evidence-based healthcare systems anywhere in the world. Thanks, Carl. Do uh, come forward with, with, with more questions. You know, we want as much audience participation as, uh, as, as possible, particularly um, there's people here working all types of organisations in, in research and international policy organisations. It'd be really interesting to hear the relevance of this type of work, both the demand side estimates and the supply side estimates for uh, those of who, you who are working within uh, within global health uh, in, in, in institutions. How could you use this work? Um, what more could it provide you um, to, to to be informative with the type of challenges that you that you face? Um, I just, just wonder if I could pick up on a, um, a, a, a question. I found it really interesting, uh, Lisa, when you mentioned um, the life, value of a life of, um, year measure. I can't remember the price, uh, precise term you used. Uh, but so, so generally, the value on children's lives uh, per year is, is very high. And then it follows a kind of a hump shape pattern uh, through adulthood. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of um, the. Uh, WHO approach that they used to use where there was age waiting uh, follow, uh, following a hump pattern. Uh, I think some people felt it was due to um, concern for productivity or that people within the uh, that middle part of the life may have their deaths or uh, their ill health may have a proportionally larger um, uh, it, it, it impact. I think that's the exception um, to applications of cost effectiveness analysis generally where usually the rule of a quality is a quality is a quality or is a dally a dally is a dally um, uh, usually is um, adopted and Jay, um, Dean picked, picked up on, on this in, in his discussion but it'd be really good to hear from you Lisa in terms of whether you think the demand side um, uh, approaches estimates could really help us to think um, more carefully about how we value life through different stages and, um, and, and for different individuals, particularly in relation to age? Uh, sure. Um, I think uh, um, maybe I should step back for a minute and say something that I don't know whether you all are aware of. There is um, an astronomical difference between how much money is spent estimating willingness to pay, um, how much research funding there is, and how much there is estimating qualities and dollies. Um, I, at different points in my career, have uh, tried to figure out some way of actually sort of coming up with a metric for that, but uh, it's probably orders of magnitude difference. Um, we think there are a lot of VSL studies, um, but just the last count we did within the past uh, few weeks got us up to about 200 worldwide. It's not very many studies. We feel like it's a lot because there's not, um, uh, there's just not a lot of research in this area. So. Um, we know less about people's willingness to pay than I think you all know about qualities and dollies and, and related issues. So that's the first point, um, which leads to the second point, which is if you, um, so we're about to come out with a uh, um, symposium on estimating the VSL in low and middle income countries in the Journal of Benefit Cost Analysis uh, that should be out sometime this month. Um, and. Uh, 
what you'll see if you look at that or some of the other things is that uh, most people who do benefit cost analysis do not adjust for age. Not because we think that the VSL is invariant by age, but because the literature is just so unsettled. The relationships that I uh, um, was, were, was just talking about, in my mind, are the relationships that have been found in the, the most studies or are best supported, but there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of inconsistency in the research results and a lot that we don't understand. So that's the second point is that, uh, um, although we think the relationships follow um, the sort of pattern I was describing, um, we're not all that confident in those relationships. The third point is that when we're talking about dollies, we're often talking about low and middle income countries. All of this research has been done in high income countries. And I think as you know, Dean and I've had uh, several conversations about you know, just doing a thought experiment about how you might value mortality risks at different ages. You can think about lots of reasons why um, these functions, the function of uh, these values by age would differ in a low or middle income country um, from in a high income country. So I think that that layers another uh, set of uncertainties. Um, even if we came to closure and knew for sure what the relationship looked like in the United States or in other high income countries, um, I'm not sure that would hold in these lower income countries. So it's probably a very unsatisfactory answer, um, but, uh, um, and I know, uh, I try really hard not to say more research is needed when I'm sitting in these sorts of sessions, but I think this is an area where, where we do need more work. If I, Cal, sorry to speak again, but I, I, I think Lisa's right, and, and I think the take home ought to be that this is not either or. It's not either the demand side or the supply side. Actually, the two things are complementary. Insofar as we did have good evidence that people were willing to pay very different amounts for different types of qualities gained or dallies averted in different contexts, that's fine. We'll multiply the dallies or the qualities gained by how much we're willing to pay, but we will also multiply the qualities and all the dallies foregone on the opportunity cost side by exactly the same numbers. Yeah, that's the important thing. So you need an understanding of the supply side and the demand side if you want to reflect those subtle differences. The second thing is to just pick up on Dean. The other reason, uh, something Dean said about using it as a new mirror, I couldn't agree more. We also actually need to know something about how we, what we think health is worth in consumption terms when we start to look across sectors. In the UK, our estimate is about £13,000 per quality. We've re-estimated it for 10 years and it's still about £13,000 per quality. What does that should it be that low with the fish for the richest country on earth? Personally, no, I don't. But you know what? If you think 13 is too low, then vote for more taxes, vote for more public borrowing, or vote for a massive redistribution of public expenditure. But 13,000 is what you voted for. So hey, there you go. What do we? What else do we know? What we know is that the evidence suggests that people are willing to pay at least 30,000 pounds for quality. What does that tell you? It tells you something about the shadow price on public expenditure. It's telling you that an NHS pound is worth two to three times as much as a private consumption pound. And that's really important when we're looking at interventions which ha have impacts across multiple sectors. It's also telling you something about other forms of public expenditure. If we've allocated our exp public expenditure sensibly, if the ratio of private money to public money is three to one in health, it's probably three to one in education. It's probably three to one in criminal justice. So that helps us start to understand something about how we ca account for cross-sectoral impacts. And it's also, if you like, saying, making accountable the decisions that have been made. You know, if you don't like that, then vote for more taxes. Yeah, so I was being greedy. No one was queuing up, so I thought I'd yeah, come yeah, with another one. Um, I mean, you kind of, you may have answered this already, Carl, but, uh, I was thinking, I know just get the, the views of the, the panel on this. Obviously, they are two different things. You know, what the cost effectiveness threshold you're, you're talking about is, is what are we willing to spend, more of affordability index. And the VSL is more what are we willing to, and it's one is at the individual level, and of course, our, our, the value of my health is far more important than everyone else's. Whereas, at the, you know, the other one is at the societal level, obviously, it tends to be low. So they are slightly different things, but. I wonder whether, you know, we're talking about 13,000, we're talking about 27,000, we've heard. We, all these sort of very small numbers. We look at VSL and it's like, a value of a life here is $386,000. I mean, the, the difference is ginormous. Is that an indication of the real difference between 
value and affordability, or is it an indication of how terrible we are at doing this and how, you know, how how much of a gap there is in our knowledge and our ability to understand this? Because that's a that's a huge difference. Right. Um, so uh, um, I think I. Um, the, uh, in the U.S., it's, it's interesting to me to be talking to people who work in the U.K. because in the U.S., um, our health care budget is not fixed in quite the same way that it is in the U.K. Um, so we're often thinking about cross-sectoral allocations. A lot of the work that I do um, has to do with federal regulations. Some of those are public health focused. Some of them are environmental. Some of them are things like traffic safety. Um, but um, it's cross... It, uh, um, we're not thinking so much about we have a fixed budget as we're thinking about um, there's all these resources in the United States, um, how should they be allocated um, in addressing these different problems. Um, I want to talk for a second, though, about affordability because affordability is a piece of the willingness to pay framework because your willingness to pay is constrained by your income. Um, and it's not because we just care about money, it's because income at either individual level things so there is an affordability element to it, but it's at a much more um, at a much broader level than just thinking about within the healthcare system. I mean, one one way of thinking about these is that um, they may advocate for more uh, a greater allocation of resources. I mean, this gets back to your point about voting to a greater allocation of resources towards health rather than towards other things, or at least towards interventions that may be outside of the healthcare system, um, like education or environmental improvements, but that have big impacts on health. Um, Carl and Dean. Um, it, certainly, the, the recent reviews of the willingness to pay for a quality, which isn't just based on VSL, but based on contingent value in DCE, there's a lot of variation, as you'd expect, but those two recent reviews suggest that it's somewhere for the UK, if you take the meta regression, it's somewhere around £30,000 per quality. That's pretty much where I'd expect it to be. The original work by the Department of Health, which refers back to very old VSL estimates, they were working at £60,000 per quality, but with £15,000 per quality on the supply side, given that uh, ratio of kind of four to one uh, on the shadow price. So I would expect these individual willingness to pay studies to generate values that are higher than the, the supply side because public money is scarce. Oh, it, it, it's scarcer than private money. Private money might be scarce as well, but public money is even scarcer. And we just have to look around the world at the kind of fiscal stance of most governments at the moment to, to kind of realize that we're all in an age of austerity. So public pounds are very rare, and that means they're very valuable and much more valuable than private pounds. Uh, what was I going to say? I'm going to stop. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to comment um, just a little further on the use of ratios versus um, um, net present value or net differences. And I think it's not an either or. It's a matter of um, what you're using the numbers for. And I think we... Uh, on ratios, uh, basically our characteristics, a cost-effectiveness ratio, is a characteristic of a technology. A net present value expressed in lives or in dollars uh, is a characteristic of a government policy subject to constraints. They're, they're characteristics of extremely different things. If one's allocating public resources subject to the restrict constraints one has, clearly one wants to look at something like net present value. But if one's trying to get a sense of the relative attractiveness, a heuristic, of the range of technologies available to the healthcare system, I think we better pay attention to cost-effectiveness um, ratios. Um, a second um, point about when to do what. Um, I think that, to me, the introduction into the discussion of health system policy, health sector policy, of the concept of measuring cost in lives, and I much prefer lives to dallies because people can, can understand lives and dallies are qualities, pretty artificial constructs with a lot of value judgments in them, but lives are, are pretty simple. But it's the same concept. The value of doing that is to constantly remind us if we want to do a little bit more of this with the healthcare system, it's costing some lives if, in the, if the budget isn't at the same time capable of being um, 
adjusted. So I think that's a big improvement in our discourse. But I wouldn't take it into um, two other domains. One, into intersectoral resource allocation. I would continue to use the dollar metric and I would therefore be wanting to turn those lives at some transformation rate into dollars uh, to allow both intersectoral resource allocation decisions, and I'm not nearly as hopeful as Carl is that our, um, our governments are, are equalizing at the margin here in the, the Copenhagen consensus benefit cost uh, variations would suggest that they, they certainly are underestimating investing in um, health. Um, Ijeoma? Um, I just wanted to kind of um, stress what, what Dean um, um, just said. Uh, it, it's quite interesting to hear that his VSL might be um, uh, a methodology that, could, that will be developed in low- and middle-income countries, but we, were, we are where we are with the cost-effectiveness thresholds in, in low- and middle-income countries, and, and, and a country like South Africa depends, uses the one to three times percent, uh, three times GDP per capita in, in making um, in de decision-making. Decision and uh, it, it is crucial that whichever method we use, we acknowledge that, that perhaps more harm is, is being done by using the, the current threshold. And, and, and what we're trying to do is to work out something that would reasonably be um, they are within the limits of what can be afforded within, within the current um, budget. And, and it's, it's very... Um, you know, most the, the budget is, is, is constrained and it's not realistic to expect that, that there will be some way the budget, the healthcare budget could be expanded to, to accommodate more technology. And, and so I think it's, it's crucial that we, 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 we find something, um, whether the estimate is completely realistic, but something that, that would allow better decisions to be made in terms of allocating resources to help. I wanted to say uh, one thing related to Carl's point on the willingness to pay per quality studies or per, per dollar studies that I'm hoping somebody will do. Um, I think we need to be careful um, not to lump all those studies into sort of one group because uh, one of the things that we are working on now is a meta-analysis of uh, studies that look at the value per quality f um, for non-fatal effects. So these are um, studies that ask people to value less than the full quality. Um, there is also a lot of literature out there that asks people to value a full quality, basically a life year. Um, and uh, um, what those different types of studies come up, those different types of studies really are measuring different things. I mean, as soon as you move into a willingness to pay framework, you're starting to recognize that anything we spend money on has lots of different attributes. And our willingness to pay for those things is gonna depend on the spe specific attributes of the outcome. It's also gonna depend on who we are, uh, things like our age, our health status, our income, um, many other things. Um, so um, when we, you know, if we were giving a different talk which had to do with the value per quality studies, I think we'd very quickly get to the point where we're distinguishing between uh, studies that look at different outcomes because they are not all the same. And Cal? Um, I guess it was just to say that, you know, that this issue about the supply side of our healthcare systems exists whatever kind of healthcare system we've got, whether it's like the UK where we've got a collectively funded healthcare system with budgets set through a political process, whether we've got social insurance, or indeed where we've got a primarily private insurance market, the supply side <coughs> issue still exists. So for example, the, the session that they happen to have uh, coordinated ideally, uh, the same time as this one with James Lomas, our co-author on this, uh, and David Van Ness talking about how to estimate this, uh, methods for estimation of this, a key issue, one thing that I'd love to do is to start doing this for the United States because the idea that increased healthcare costs in the United States don't have health effects is clearly false. Adding something in to a benefits package and increasing healthcare costs has health effects because it makes insurance 
very expensive. It means that employers reduce their benefits uh, coverage. It means that co-payments and deductibles go up, but it means that some Americans don't get health insurance at all, or others that do have it, it turns out that they can't actually access it when they get ill. Um, so, so no matter what healthcare system we're in, changes in healthcare costs have health effects. And kind of understanding that is critical whether we want to think about making decisions based on you know, constructs like qualies and dallies, whether we want to make decisions based on, if you like, natural measures, or whether we want to make decisions which incorporate evidence around people's individual willingness to pay for those attributes. Whatever our choice about that, we do need to know what our system's delivering to us, whether we've got you know, a UK socialised medicine or the empire of liberty, here in the United States. I just ask a question, if I could, on, on, on that, Carl. So this, in the session, we're uh, interested in low-income countries particularly, uh, and um, if we're concerned with the features of low-income countries and how that affects um, our thinking estimates of, 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 of thresholds, um, many countries are extremely donor-dependent, and they don't have fungibility in the use of, of funding across diseases particularly. Sometimes it can be as narrow as interventions, but often diseases with um, the global fund diseases, HIV, TB, malaria being particularly, um, uh, receiving particularly the bulk of, of financing, uh, where other diseases receive very little. Should we also be thinking of estimating supply side thresholds uh, by diseases, as well as taking healthcare systems system resources as, as a whole and what, 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 could, what insights could that um, uh, give us? Personally, I wouldn't want to do it by diseases, but I would want to know, uh, like for example, the session earlier this morning, the work that we've been doing with the ministry uh, in Malawi, um, the evidence that we've got suggests that $61 diverts you a dally in Malawi. Um, if a donor <coughs> is restricting their assistance to Malawi, uh, to interventions which are $500 uh, a dally, then, then we need to sit down and say, okay, why, what are the reasons why you are imposing such astronomical health opportunity costs on Malawi? You better have a really good reason for that because it's costing an awful lot of dallies. So tell us what the reason is. So, so it was not by disease area, but more by the funding source. And I'd love to know what the cost per dally at the margin of uh, a whole load of donor agencies actually is compared to the countries in which they're operating. Thanks. So Again, it's all about holding to account. That's net, and we, we, we have a, a minute or two left, uh, probably just enough for any concluding remarks from any of the speakers? Is Lisa, um, uh, oh, sorry, Joe, I didn't realize you. No, no, it's fine. I mean, not, not necessarily. Um, but yeah, I, I think the point you raised is quite an, an interesting one, whether to estimate by disease area and, and, and Carl, um, your comment is quite useful. But I think we need to always think about, you know, the, the data limitations in, in, in these countries when we're trying to do these sort of studies, because that's a huge limitation. I mean, in South Africa, you'd imagine, you know, being one a middle-income country, we still suffer from that data. And finding, um, for example, trying to model disease-specific health outcome um, spending effect, um, we might be able to do it for um, HIV because there's a conditional grant for HIV, and we can track spending in HIV and track um, HIV-related health outcomes. But when you start to go into other disease areas, then then you might run into um, data issues and not knowing wh what is being allocated to what. So I, I think, um, you know, I'd like to sound a, a note of caution in doing this kind of studies in low and middle income countries where data and, and actually understanding how resources are allocated in these countries might be a bit problematic, yeah. Maybe that's interesting. Just on, on that point, I wonder, just one final question. Given how profound these issues are of uh, informing allocation of resources and the value of, of, of healthcare spending, is there anything which uh, particularly is acting as a constraint to doing um, demand side or supply side re research currently? And what could be overdone to um, what could be done to overcome those constraints? So, how how could this research feel looking five years? And what do we need to do to get there? Um, well, you know, I think uh, in terms of the demand side things, we really um, do need more research, but I think that there's two forms that that can take. And one is that 
Um, Dean alluded to this a little bit in his remarks. We do have diff two different methods of estimating these values. One is based on uh, um, market goods and services. Uh, we can extrapolate um, from people's trade-offs between wages and risk or willingness to buy helmets, um, all kinds of behaviors, what they're willing to pay for risk reductions. Um, and the biggest constraint in not being able to do those studies in low and middle income countries is actually data. So I think things that are building up the data systems are, would be enormously helpful across the board. The other types of studies that we do are these, these studies where we go out and survey people. And I think that there is a big opportunity here. Um, people have been very creative in thinking about uh, bringing down the cost of surveys, doing them in countries uh, um, where uh, um, you know, populations are dispersed, where there's a lot of different challenges. I think the, the prevalence of cell phones uh, and the internet um, has made a huge difference, and I think it'd be um, much more, uh, we have much more ability to do those sorts of surveys in low and middle income countries uh, um, now than we did years ago. It really just takes uh, some funding and uh, a, a group of people are interested in pursuing that. And Cal, Ajemo? Yeah, I, um, I already, um, I, I think that the huge limitation with doing this sort of study, like, uh, like I, I alluded to earlier, is, is data constraints. And I'm, I'm not sure what the quickest way to, to solve in that. Um, for example, if we look at um, um, some work we were, were doing in South Africa, trying to work out how much is the, 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 the South African government, but at a national level, at the provincial level, spend on maternal and child health, for example, um, hasn't been a very easy task because the way the data is collected doesn't allow for such estimates. And, and so um, get, getting um, the, 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 gov the government, but at level or the, at the national or provincial level, to try to think in this, in this way, um, well, it is it's something that's left to be seen how that, that can be done. But I think, I think the huge limitation is, is data and whether um, such studies that, that have been done, the, the Woods uh, uh, at all paper where you use um, South Africa estimates from the UK to try to work out um, how, what the cost effectiveness threshold for other countries would be taking into account their GDP per capita. Maybe that might be the way um, to go for other countries where such data is unavailable to estimate health, health spending effects. We've reached our time. If there's any quick final comment, just walk on, quick, quick one, Carl. Uh, I think it's happening. So in the other session that's going on, there's work that's almost completed in Australia doing this with in-country data. Spain has completed. The papers are submitted to journals, should be out soon. Netherlands it's underway. Norway has adopted our work, adjusted for purchasing power parity while they do their own work. I've just come back from Canada. They're gonna start again using initially our work to get that from the cross country data for their provinces, but then use that as the spur to actually do it from with, within country data. Dave Van Ness in the other session is talking about doing it for the US. We've just seen South Africa is well on the way with what appears to be some excellent econometrics. There's work underway in Indonesia. There's work that's just starting in India for the profit for the states uh, based on cross-country work, but then developing it with within-country data. So I do think this is on the way, and I think we will gradually, iteratively improve our understanding. Data is a problem, and I agree. I think we, we, we need to use the data we have to hand. I have to say, the biggest barrier to this, I have to say, is the academy, academics, editors, and peer reviewers, because I have to say, the academy tends to want to investigate convenient questions where you can estimate things precisely and get a nice paper in a high impact journal. And you know what? The really important questions are the difficult questions. We don't pick the questions, the pe questions pick us. And then we have to deal with whatever data we have to hand. And having a culture where academics were primarily employed to address important questions, no matter what the data looks like, and no matter how difficult it might be, and no matter how uncertain, then that would be an excellent, uh, that would be an excellent outcome. Some thoughts to finish on. Thank you, speakers, and thanks to the audience. <laughs>